shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. And then shall the end come. Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Our subject today is the Great Tribulation. The Bible foretells a time of great tribulation that will occur right before the battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus to the earth. Persecution of Jews and Christians is presently increasing at an alarming rate. So, are we witnessing the buildup to the great tribulation right now? Let's talk about something first. What is the great tribulation? The Bible foretells in many places a specific time called the great tribulation. We need to know about the great tribulation for two reasons. We are approaching the time called the great tribulation right now. That's number one. Number two, every person on earth is going to be affected by the great tribulation. Now, the prophecy came to us from Jesus himself in the most famous prophecy chapter of the entire Bible, Matthew chapter number 24. This is called the Olivet Discourse. In verse number 15, Jesus began to speak about the great tribulation. Let's see what it says. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth it, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Now the first thing, in order to understand the great tribulation, we need to understand where Judea is. In modern terminology, it's the West Bank. It's the territory that was captured by Israel in the 1967 war. It's also the area that is projected to become a Palestinian state when a peace agreement is struck between Israel and the Palestinians. There's one more thing we really need to understand about this. When the peace agreement is struck, uh, right now there are uh, 300,000 Jews living in the territory of the West Bank. So what's going to happen to them when the peace agreement is struck? Well, it's already under discussion that the Jews will remain in Judea if they choose to, living as a Jewish minority under the Palestinian state. Now, that's going to work okay for the first three and a half years of the agreement. However, like Jesus said, when the abomination of desolation occurs, then all of a sudden chaos is going to break loose and these Jews will come under terrible tribulation. Now watch what Jesus said about the tribulation and here's where the term actually comes from. Matthew 24, 21. For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time no nor ever shall be. Now this is the passage where we get the term the great tribulation. There are many other scriptures that talk about the events of the great tribulation. Let's look at the great tribulation as it's prophesied in the book of Daniel. It's Daniel 7, verse 25. And he, the Antichrist, shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times, and the dividing of time. Now, this tells us the Antichrist will wear out the saints. The great tribulation is going to last for three and one half years. How do we know? Well, here the passage, Daniel 7, 25, tells us it will be for a time, which is one year, times two years, 
and the dividing of time a half of year. Now, how do we know this for sure? Well, we know this because the great tribulation is also prophesied in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 5 through 7, listen to what it says. And there was given unto him, the Antichrist, a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Okay, so the great tribulation is prophesied in the book of Revelation. Daniel 7.25 says that the Antichrist will make war against the saints for time, times, and the dividing of time. Revelation 13.5 says the Antichrist will make war against the saints for 42 months. It's the exact same time period. These prophecies say the exact same thing. So time, times, and half a time is the same thing as 42 months. Three and a half years is 42 months. So both of these passages tell the exact same thing. Another dramatic view of the Great Tribulation is found in Revelation chapter number 12, starting with verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Think about that. And Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. So what's this all about? Some people think this war happened way back before the creation of mankind. However, we're going to see from this passage that this is a future war that has not happened yet. This war will trigger the final three and a half years called the Great Tribulation. Now, the Bible teaches us earlier in the 12th chapter, it talks about a woman that's travailing to have a child, and Satan stands before the child to devour him as soon as he's born. The woman has 12 stars about her head representing the 12 tribes of Israel. The woman is Israel. The child that's to be born is Jesus Christ. Satan actually did try to kill Jesus as soon as he was born, but he failed. The Bible says the child would be caught up to God and to his throne. So what's this war all about then? It's Satan's last ditch effort to dethrone God. He knows that his time's about up. Well, as a result of his war against God, against this Uh, what he's trying to do to overthrow God, Satan is going to be banished from appearing anymore in heaven. It says his place is no more found in heaven. Now, Satan has access to heaven today. The Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. He accused Job back in Job's day. He still is accusing the brethren today, but not for much longer because in Revelation chapter number 12, verse 10, it tells us, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which did accuse them before our God day and night. Now that shows us that Satan was not cast down before the beginning because it says before he was cast down, he accused the brethren. So he's been the ongoing accuser of God's people since the beginning of mankind, the beginning of creation. The passage goes on to say, Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them, but woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. So when Satan is defeated three and a half years before Armageddon, he's cast into the earth and confined to the earth no more to appear before the throne of God. The Bible says, Woe be to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for Satan comes down to you having great wrath. Many people have mistakenly believed 
that the great tribulation is the wrath of God. It's not. The great tribulation is the wrath of Satan. It says it right there in the passage. Satan comes down having great wrath because he knows he's only got a short time. Now, what's going to happen to the woman with the 12 stars? What's going to happen to Israel? The Bible teaches that Israel is going to be protected from the Antichrist and from the Great Tribulation all during this final three and a half years that Jesus called the Great Tribulation. The passage is Revelation 12, 13 through 14. And when the dragon, Satan, saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child, that's Israel, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she's nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. There's that terminology again. A time is one year, times is two years, half a time is half a year. It's the time of the great tribulation. But notice that when Satan tries to destroy Israel, that Israel is going to have a means of preservation. The Bible says there will be given to the woman two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into her place where she's going to be nourished from the face of the serpent for three and one half years. So Satan is defeated. He's banished from appearing in heaven. And now he says, I'm going to go make war against Israel and against all the people of God upon the earth. So Israel's protected for three and one half years. However, Satan, even though he can't get to Israel, now let's talk about that just a moment more. The Bible teaches that she will be protected in her place. There's all kinds of theories about where her place is, but it's obvious. Her place is the nation of Israel, the place that God promised Abraham way back in Genesis 15, 18, that that would be his and his descendants' dwelling place forever. So Israel is going to be protected in the nation of Israel all during the Great Tribulation. Now, the way we know for sure this is true is because at the end of the Great Tribulation, at the Battle of Armageddon, the Bible says that the world government armies motivated by Satan will try to invade Israel. You don't try to invade a place that you already control. So Satan's going to persecute uh, Israel, but Israel's going to be protected as it were by the wings of a great eagle. Isn't it interesting that Israel's greatest friend today, just before the Great Tribulation, the national symbol of that nation is the eagle? Look on the back of your dollar bill. The United States of America's official symbol is the eagle. So when Satan tries to get to the nation of Israel, she's going to be prevented by the United States of America. Uh, the Bible actually says that she will be nourished from the face of the serpent for three and one half years. Well, in frustration, then Satan's going to go on to plan B. Now, here's what's going to happen. Satan is going to go through the earth persecuting both Jews and Christians. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, it tells us, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war against the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So both Christians, true Christians, and the Jews will be under persecution by the Antichrist. And we have to understand something very important here. Not all of Christianity will be persecuted by the Antichrist. Much of Christianity is going to be in an alliance with the Antichrist. So let's look now at a prelude to the Great Tribulation. Right now, anti-Semitism is on the rise across Europe. The Guardian, back in August of 2014 said that anti-Semitism is on the rise in the worst times since the Nazis. Now, let's just take a little bit of this article. I want you to hear it. In the space of just one week in Paris, France, eight synagogues 
were attacked. One was firebombed by a 400-strong mob. Additionally, a kosher supermarket and pharmacy were smashed and looted. The crowds chanted, death to the Jews, and slit the Jews' throats. There is another Holocaust coming. Jesus specifically said, then shall be great tribulation. And that's a, a, a time in the future. Then shall be great tribulation such as never has been before, nor ever again shall be. Now let's look at what else is happening throughout Europe. Anti-Semitism is reviving in all places Germany. In Germany recently, Molotov cocktails were lobbed into a synagogue which was previously destroyed. The same synagogue was previously destroyed on Kristallnacht, also known as the Night of the Broken Glass. On that night in 1938, Nazis in Germany torched synagogues, vandalized Jewish homes, schools, and businesses, and killed close to 100 Jews. That night, in the aftermath of Kristallnacht, some 30,000 Jewish men were arrested and sent to Nazi concentration camps. Also in Germany, a Berlin imam called on Allah to destroy the Zionist Jews, count them and kill them to the very last one, he said. Now, it's hard to believe that anti-Semitism is reviving in Germany, but it is. Anti-Semitism is once again raising its ugly head. It's been quietly simmering under the surface since the days of Adolf Hitler. You know that all of those people with their extreme hatred of the Jews, they've had to talk to their children. Not all of them, perhaps. Some of them tried to, be a, to, to bury the past and not pass their prejudices on to their children. But some of them, you know, has talked to their kids about the Jews. Uh, mein Kampf was a book written by Adolf Hitler to teach the, the German people to hate the Jews. So you know some of that prejudice as it always is. Now, besides the latent simmering anti-Semitism throughout Europe, there's another element now added in. 50 million Muslims now live in Europe and they are greatly adding fuel to the fire of anti-Semitism. Chants have been heard at demonstrations. There's an article, Hamas, Hamas, Jews to the gas. Bottles were thrown through the window of an anti-Semitism campaigner in Frankfurt, Germany. An elderly Jewish man was beaten up at a pro Israel rally in Hamburg. An Orthodox Jewish teenager was punched in the face in Berlin. In several cities, chants at pro-Palestinian protests compared Israel's actions to the Holocaust. Other notable slogans included, Jew, coward pig, come out and fight alone. And this is the most chilling one, Hamas, Hamas. Jews to the gas. Ladies and gentlemen, we are witnessing the buildup to the great tribulation right now. Now let me talk to you about something that's very important. Knowing that this is coming, we made a decision at End Time Ministries to launch a new fund. We're calling it the, the Another Jewish Holocaust Fund. We've already built a college in Jerusalem, we're making plans to educate the Jewish people by sending a magazine to every one of their homes. But right now, the Jewish people need to be educated. The Jews of Europe, the true Christians of Europe, need to be educated as to what's coming. The Jews of Judea have to know. We're already on television five days a week in Israel. But we've got to make sure that we te teach them what to do. But beyond teaching them what they should do, how are they going to do it? They're going to need some help. Let's say that 100,000 Jews and Christians have to flee before the persecutions of the Great Tribulation. 
you know, when they flee for their lives, they're not going to have their homes, they're not going to have their clothes, they're not going to have their jobs, their businesses. They're going to be stripped down to zero. And if we just help them at $1,000 each, this would require $100 million. If there's 100,000 of them times $1,000, that's $100 million. And when I thought about that, it's on my heart. Somebody's got to be ready to help them. And I don't know of anybody else right now that's making plans for that. And I looked at that figure and I said, Lord, that's a huge amount of money. It's like God spoke back to me and said, is it needed for my people? Well, the answer was yes. And then it's like God spoke to my heart, not, not audibly, but in my heart. Then don't be afraid to ask me for it. So what I'm asking you to do is if God's blessed you where you can, make the most generous donation possible to the Another Jewish Holocaust Fund. I'm talking about if you can give $10,000, $50,000, $100,000, or even a million dollars, we need a war chest of $100 million to save the Jewish people and also the Christians that will fall under the iron heel of the Antichrist. If you'd like to donate to this cause, now maybe you can't do 10,000, maybe you can't even do 1,000, but maybe you could do 100 or 200 or 500 or perhaps 25. It doesn't matter. You know that's between you and God. But please give us a call right now. The number to call is 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. Or you can donate at endtime.com. That's E-N-D-T-I-M-E dot com. In Daniel chapter number seven, verse number eight, there's a beast with 10 horns. A beast in Bible prophecy always symbolizes a nation or a kingdom. Horns on a beast represent the number of kings in the alliance. Well, this particular beast has 10 horns, representing 10 kings. Then the prophecy of Daniel 7 says, another horn will come up among the 10, uprooting three. And that horn will become the Antichrist. Now, the same prophecy is also in Daniel chapter number 2, verse number 31 through 45. Now, in Daniel chapter 2, there's a statue, an image, with a head of gold, arms and breasts of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, feet of iron mingled with clay. The head of gold represents Babylon. The arms and breasts of silver is media Persia. These are world empires starting with 600 B.C., then the belly and thighs of brass was the Grecian Empire that took power around 300 uh, B.C. And all of these segments were symbols of empires that would rule the world. The fourth segment was the legs of iron. That was the Roman Empire. But then you get to the feet of iron mingled with clay. The feet and the toes of iron mingled with clay. It's interesting because when you move from one segment of the uh, image to the other, it, it's a total change every time. Gold, silver, brass, iron. But when you move from the fourth empire, the Roman Empire, to the feet of iron mingled with clay, the iron element is retained, but the clay is added in. The Roman Empire ceased to exist in about 300 A.D., the Holy Roman Empire was not born until 800 A.D. when Pope Leo III put a crown on the head of Charlemagne and said, I now crown you emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. Now, the Holy Roman Empire has always been centered in Europe. That's the way we know the Antichrist will come from the Holy Roman Empire because he must come up from that last empire of iron mingled with clay. Now, let me say to you again, we've established this, another Jewish Holocaust fund. We need to educate Jews and Christians concerning what is coming. We need to use every means available to teach them what I'm teaching you today. We not only need to teach them what we're talking about today, but tell them what they should do. Now, as I said earlier, 
Let's say we have 100,000 Jews and Christians that have to run for their life. We helped them at $1,000 each, which is a bare minimum. It's probably going to be more than that. But just at that alone, we would need $100 million. And when I thought about all this and felt impressed in my heart that End Time Ministries needs to lead the way in helping Jews and Christians escape the power of the Antichrist. And oh, by the way, the Bible is very clear that there will be places on earth that will escape the clutches of the Antichrist. Most of the world will be under his power, but there will be places on earth that will escape. Jordan will never fall under the power of the Antichrist. Israel will never fall under the power of the Antichrist. And the United States of America is best friends to those two entities. And there's reason to believe that the United States will also not fall under the power of the Antichrist. Now just think about it. What if the U.S., could become a harbor of safety during the Great Tribulation? What if we could become a shelter from the coming storm and the people that want to get away from the power of the Antichrist, perhaps the United States of America, would be a place for them to run to? If we can help them, we need to help them. The Bible tells us that they that bless Abraham and his seed will be blessed. They that curse Abraham and his seed will be cursed. So, I said, God, this is a lot of money. And it's like the Lord spoke back to me and said, hey, if it's needed to help my people, don't you be afraid to ask for it. And I said, okay, uh, I'm, ju- I'm going to go ahead and just ask for it. So what I'm asking you to do is to make the very best, most generous gift you can to the Another Jewish Holocaust Fund. The number to call, 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463 or go to endtime.com. That's E-N-D-T-I-M-E dot com. When current events are found in Bible prophecy, it's astonishing. At End Time Ministries, we are seeing them unfold every day, and so can you. We've put together a current events in Bible prophecy package for anyone who wants to understand like never before. Irvin Baxter and his dedicated staff have spent hundreds of hours of research and study, and in doing so have discovered that current events in Bible prophecy are telling the same story. These 13 DVDs will prepare you to be ready in this extraordinary time that God has destined you to live. Call 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com and save over 20% when you buy the current events in Bible Prophecy Package. All my life, I have heard the statement, nobody's perfect. But one day, Hebrews 10, 14 caught my attention. It says, for by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. I attempted to reconcile this statement with what I had viewed as the many imperfections in myself. Could it be that there are human beings on this earth that God considers perfect? In You Are Perfect, Urban Baxter explains what it means to be sanctified and why God sees those that are sanctified as perfect. This teaching has given people peace and security in their walk with God because of new understanding of how God sees them. This lesson is available on DVD, CD, in printed format, or even digital download to tell you not what's wrong with you, but what's right with you. You are perfect. Call 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com to get yours today. If your radio station only carries the first 30 minutes of End of the Age, go to endtime.com to continue to listen to today's broadcast. Let's look at what the Great Tribulation will actually be like. It's going to be a time of world government. Daniel 7, 23 says, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and watch, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. So the Antichrist is going to dominate the entire world. Like I said earlier, though, there will be a few nations that will resist the Antichrist. He actually is going to be fighting wars during the final three and one and a half years. Now, the Antichrist is going to form an alliance with a world religion. So we're going to have a world government and a world religion. The world government is depicted in Revelation uh, chapter number 13, verse 1 through 8. 
the world government and its rule of the Antichrist. But then in the latter part of the chapter, uh, Revelation chapter 13, verse 11 through 14, it talks about another beast. It talks about a two-horned beast. And this beast, well, let me just read it to you. He exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. The second beast is the false prophet. The Bible says he looks like a lamb, but he speaks like a dragon. He looks like Jesus Christ, but he speaks like the devil. Do you realize the false prophet is going to be the world's leading Christian? This is going to be a time of great deception. So we've got to make sure that we inform the world as to what's coming and what they should do about it. Now, the Bible tells us that the false prophet will influence the world to pledge their allegiance and to worship the Antichrist. The Bible says the Antichrist will make war against all that oppose him. Revelation chapter 13, verse number 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given to him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. This is talking about the time called the Great Tribulation. Now, the Bible teaches us that every person on earth that falls under the power of the Antichrist and his one world government will be required to pledge their allegiance to the Antichrist. Revelation 13, 15 says it this way. And he, the false prophet, had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So the false prophet is going to be a part of this unity of politics and religion. It's going to be a revival of the Holy Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire has always been ruled by a political leader from Europe and a spiritual leader every time from Italy. Study the, the Holy Roman Empire from 800 AD until 1800 for 1,000 years. They dominated Europe. Well, the Bible says the Holy Roman Empire is going to be reborn, and that's where the Antichrist and the false prophets. It's going to be the same picture. Political leader, spiritual leader. Well, guess what? The Holy Roman Empire has now been reborn. It happened November the 3rd of 2009. Okay, now some will be killed during the Great Tribulation, perhaps many. However, there's going to be another form of pressure in order to force people to worship the Antichrist. It's called the mark of the beast. Revelation chapter 13, verse 16 through 17 describes it. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hands or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, those who do not pledge allegiance to the Antichrist will be placed under economic sanctions. In other words, if you refuse to pledge allegiance to the Antichrist and his one world government, they will not validate your number that's going to be required for buying and selling. Well, where are we right now in this whole scenario? Most nations today already have a national ID. Around 100 countries have compulsory national ID cards, and you've got to have these cards in order to function in their, in their nation. As a matter of fact, if you're stopped by the police in a nation with a pulsary ID card, you will be immediately arrested if you don't have your card with you. Now, in addition to the 100 that have these compulsory cards, most other nations have voluntary national ID cards. Now, the U.S. is attempting to set up a national ID right now. America has always opposed the national ID. For example, uh, back in 1981, Ronald Reagan was president at the time. And there was one of his cabinet members. They were trying to solve the immigration problem, much like we're trying to do right now. And the cabinet member came into the meeting that day and said, look, the only way to solve this is to give every person their own national ID number. That way, 
They can't hold jobs in America without this national ID. And if they can't hold jobs, they have no reason to come here. They have no way of supporting themselves. And when he made that proposal, Ronald Reagan quickly said, we're not doing that. That's the mark of the beast. That meeting is actually recorded in the congressional record. I looked it up for myself. Well, I don't think we've got a Ronald Reagan around here right now. I hope perhaps we do. But let's talk about where we are right now as far as the implementation of a national ID here in the United States of America. There was an act called the Real ID Act that was signed by President George W. Bush on May the 11th of 2005. Now, the Senate couldn't ratify this bill because a lot of opposition was in the Senate. They did not want to sign on to a national ID. Americans had resisted a national ID for 230 years. We don't want to be uh, labeled and tracked and controlled. We don't want to be put in a database where the government can watch everything we do everywhere we go. So there's a lot of pressure against this. So what did the politicians do? They slipped the Real ID Act that they knew they could not get through the Senate. They put it on the backside of a 1,000-page bill providing military appropriations for our troops that were in Iraq at the time. Well, it was a must-pass bill. The Senate voted 100 to 0 to pass it through, and President George W. Bush signed the Real ID Act. Well, opposition soon arose to the Real ID Act. uh, Anti Ministries led the way. We actually published an entire magazine on the Real ID Act and sent it to every U.S. senator, every U.S. congressman, the president, the vice president. We sent it to every state senator, every state congressman because we wanted to head this off. Well, as a result of our efforts and the efforts of many others, 25 states out of 50 passed laws or resolutions against implementing the real ID. Now, the deadline for implementation was May the 11th of 2008. Well, that deadline was missed. All of the states were putting their heels in the sand saying, we're not going to participate in the real ID, the National ID Act. Well, a new deadline was set December the 31st of 2009. That one too was missed the states still would not comply. The next deadline was set May the 10th of 2011. Well, that deadline was missed as well. But the government, the federal government is determined. They want this kind of power over every single individual in the United States of America. The next deadline was missed uh, January the 15th of 2013. They've now set a new deadline, January the 15th, 2015. That one's going to be missed as well. So they have said, January the 1st, 2016 is the absolute deadline. We're not going to give any further uh, delays. We are going to to enforce this right now. Now, one thing that's happening is the politicians are realizing they may never be able to enforce the Real ID Act because there's still so many states that just simply say, we're not going to do that. We are not going to sign on to a national ID that can track and control our citizens. So there's another plan that has come up called E-Verify. E-Verify is an internet-based free program run by the United States government that compares information from employees' employment eligibility verification form I-9 to data from the U.S. government records. If the information matches, that employee is eligible to work in the United States. If there's a mismatch, E-Verify alerts the employer and the employee is allowed to work while he or she resolves the problem. They must contact the appropriate agency to resolve the mismatch within eight federal government working days from the federal date. The program is operated by the Department of Homeland Security in partnership with the Social Security administration. An article came out recently entitled, Making E-Verify Mandatory. The Office of Management and Budget Directive mandates that all federal government agencies sign up to use E-Verify by October the 1st of 2007. This is long past and it's now been implemented. 
As of September the 8th of 2009, employers with federal contracts or subcontracts that contain the federal acquisition regulation E-Verify clause are required to use E-Verify to determine the employment eligibility of one, employees performing direct substantial work under those federal contracts, and two, new hires organization-wide, regardless of whether they are working on a federal contract or not. So since they realize they may not ever be able to implement the Real ID, now they're going up and say, well, let's do E-Verify then, and let's get all of the federal employees to doing it, and the big contractors with work for the government, let's get them to doing it, and after a while, the whole United States of America will accept it. Well, the Senate passed an immigration bill in 2013, and you might know, embedded in this bill passed by the Senate was the E-Verify system, a national ID. Here's what it says. Implementing a system for all employers to verify electronically their workers' legal status. Notice it says all employers. The Senate passed it in 2013. So far, the House has refused to consider this bill. Now, what am I telling you? I'm telling you in the United States of America, the only thing between us and a national ID is a vote in the House of Representatives. Most recently, there's a lot of clamor and motive to pass an immigration bill. Will they pass it? That remains to be seen. But if they do, they'll probably pass the bill that's already been passed by the Senate. And if so, a national ID will be implemented in the United States of America. Now, that's showing us how close we actually are right now. I'm talking about the need to help people. We're on the prelude to the Great Tribulation right now. I don't know whether we've got four years left before the Great Tribulation begins or four and a half or five or I can't tell you for certain, but we're in the vicinity. And if we don't act right now, we won't have time when everything comes down. The Jews of Germany waited too late to get out, and as a result, they perished in the horrible Holocaust. Well, there's another Holocaust coming. That's the reason we've established another Jewish Holocaust fund. We need to educate the Jews, tell them what's coming, and we intend to do that through television, through radio, through the Internet. We need to teach them what they should do. The number to call, one 800 end time that's 1-800-363-8463 or go to endtime.com and there you can also contribute on the website. The seeds of the Battle of Armageddon were sown on November 29th, 2012. The seeds sown on that historic day are in the process of producing a dreadful harvest. The Bible actually describes it as the harvest of Armageddon. Learn the story of what happened on November 29th, 2012 when the seeds were sown for the world's final battle, the growth of which are the events that will occur on the journey to where the story ends at the reaping of the harvest of Armageddon. Call 1-800-END-TIME to order this important lesson. I want to introduce you today to what I call the Armageddon Hospital. It was October of 2010. The headline, Israel Builds World's Largest Underground Hospital, immediately arrested my attention. When I read that it was being built in Haifa, Israel, I fully understood the implications of this announcement. Haifa is located at the western end of the plain of Megiddo, the prophesied site of the Battle of Armageddon. Would the world's largest underground hospital specifically designed for use in time of war actually become the hospital to which the wounded of the Battle of Armageddon would be brought? It was obvious to me that the answer to this question was undoubtedly yes. Go to endtime.com and under Irvin's Thoughts, click the Rombaum link to watch the video. Okay, so we're seeing the beginnings of the Great Tribulation. Europe will be the power base of the Great Tribulation and of the Antichrist. Jews and true Christians 
will have to escape from Europe if they are to avoid the Holocaust that is coming. Now, anti-Semitism is expanding around the world. Let me give you some examples. In Austria, a pre-season friendly game had to be rescheduled. It was a game of soccer. After the Israeli side's previous match was called off following an attempted assault on its players. In the Netherlands, the Netherlands' main anti-Semitism watchdog, City, had more than 70 calls from alarmed Jewish citizens one week last month. The average number of calls is normally three to five. They had 70. In Amsterdam, Holland, Rabbi Benjamin Jacobs had his front door stoned and two Jewish women were attacked. One was beaten, the other was a victim of arson. Why? Well, they hung Israeli flags from their balconies. So anti-Semitism is around the world. Let me give you more examples. In Belgium, a woman was reportedly turned away from a shop with the words, we don't currently sell to Jews. Can you imagine? What if you saw in your country a sign that said, we don't currently sell to Jews? It's amazing. In Italy, the Jewish owners of dozens of shops and other businesses in Rome arrived to find swastikas and anti-Jewish slogans daubed on shutters and windows. One slogan read, Jews, your end is near. In Spain, the Jewish community is planning action against El Mundo after the Daily Paper published a column by 83-year-old playwright Antonio Gala questioning Jews' ability to live peacefully with others. It's not strange they have been so frequently expelled. So he's saying there's a reason why Jews are persecuted and it's their fault. Remember, Jews, your end is near. The Jews are leaving France. Now, France's Society for the Protection of the Jewish Community says annual totals of anti-Semitic acts in the 2000s are seven times higher than in the 1990s. Seven times. The Jewish Agency for Israel said 1,407 French Jews left for Israel in 2013, a 72% rise over the previous year. Where are we right now? in this whole scenario. Now, I want to show you some more evidence. In Uganda, uh, this article just appeared. Uganda, no job without a national ID card. Of course, no job, no buying and selling. The prophecy says every person will have to have a national ID or some kind of a mark in order to be able to buy or sell. If you don't buy or sell, uh, of course, if you have no job, you can't buy or sell. The Observer on August the 6th of 2013 said it this way. Ugandans without the newly introduced national identity cards will not qualify for employment, education, travel, or health care in the country, government recently announced. Issuance of national IDs kicked off last month in Kololo. Now, the same technology is being planned right now for the United States of America. Now, this article comes from Find Biometrics on July the 9th of 2014. A national electronic ID card by 2018. In five years' time, half of the world's population will have a chip-based national electronic ID card, including near-complete regional coverage. Notice this, in Europe, says Acuity Principal Maxine Most. The electronic ID platform will encourage significant expansion of e-government services and provide the foundation for the development of national and global trusted authentication infrastructures. Now remember, the Antichrist power base will be Europe. It says that especially in regional Europe, this is going to happen. In the blaze on July the 20th of 2014, this article appeared, Cash to Society, Closer Than You Think. Is cash becoming extinct? 
a growing number of economists and financial experts are saying a cashless society isn't far off. A recent survey reveals that 78% of Americans carry with them less than $50 at any given time. Another 10% say they don't carry dollar bills or change at all. Apple just came out with new iPhones that make the cashless society possible. When you're buying something, you just point your iPhone at the terminal, you put your fingerprint on the button at the bottom of the iPhone and immediately it's paid. The merchant never is able to see your card, your card number, even your name. So consequently, ID theft is gonna be greatly reduced at that time. Now, as we're continuing on here, it's so important to realize that this Touch ID with Apple is a cutting edge technology that some people think will actually sweep the United States of America into the cashless society. All right. Let me go take you now to Zimbabwe. In Zimbabwe, they have a system called Econet, and it looks like it's going to usher Zimbabwe into being the first cashless society. This comes from the Guardian Professional on August the 18th of 2014. Here's what it says. Will, Zimbabwe's, will Zimbabwe be Africa's first cashless society? Telecommunications company and now mobile banking service Econet Wireless predicts that in less than 12 months, notes and coins will be long gone from this southern African country. We do not expect anyone to still be using paper money in a year's time. The company's CEO, Douglas Mabawini, recently said. Now, what about in the United States of America? The Federal Drug Administration actually approved computer chips for humans. This is from NBC News on October the 13th of 2004. Medical milestone or privacy invasion. A tiny computer chip approved Wednesday for implantation, implantation in a patient's arm can speed vital information about a patient's medical history to doctors and hospitals. But critics warn that it could open new ways to imperil the confidentiality of medical records. In Fox News, August the 30th of 2014, this article appeared. Is there a microchip implant in your future? You can inject one under your skin and no one will ever notice, the article said, using short-range radio frequency identification signals, RFID. It can transmit your identity as you pass through a security checkpoint or walk into a football stadium. It can help you buy groceries at Walmart in a worst case scenario, if you are kidnapped in a foreign country, for example, it could save your life. Now, microchip implants like the ones pet owners use to track their dogs and cats could become commonplace in humans in the next decade. So, will microchip implants in humans become mandatory? Is this the way the mark of the beast is going to be implemented? A wave of the hand will take care of everything. Once you get an implanted chip, no more showing passports when you travel or your driver's license to a policeman. And since microchipping would facilitate a cashless society, there'd be no more worries about cash loss or theft. So... Will microchip implants become mandatory? The New American on May the 3rd of 2014 said this. Dr. Mark Gasson of the UK's University of Reading says concerning the implanted RFID chip, it has the potential to change the very essence of what it is to be human. He believes that microchip's acceptance will mirror that of mobile phones and that a situation will develop wherein it will be such a disadvantage not to have the implant that it will essentially not be optional. Okay, so the Great Tribulation, that's our subject today. How close are we? The Great Tribulation will begin 
three and one half years after a peace agreement between Palestinians and Israelis. In about a month from the time of this recording, Palestinians will ask the UN to mandate a peace agreement in the Middle East. Now, right now, because Israel is unwilling to surrender Jerusalem and says we're not going to surrender Jerusalem, even the U.S. is threatening to distance itself from Israel. That brings us down to this question. What should we be doing? Well, number one, we need to evangelize the world by preaching the prophecies of the Bible concerning the events that lie just ahead. The material in this lesson needs to be worldwide. John 14, 29, Jesus said, and now I have told you before it come to pass that when it does come to pass, you might believe. So we need to pray for Jews. We need to pray for Christians that are right now coming under persecution. And believe me, it's going to escalate. We need to help Jews and Christians to immigrate to Israel or the United States. Here's a prophecy for the end time. Daniel eleven thirty two, 32. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he, the Antichrist, corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God are going to be strong and do exploits. Think of it. Exploits. Well, it's time for those exploits right now. We need to help Jews and Christians from Europe and around the world that are coming under increasing pressure to immigrate to Israel or to the United States. We need to educate Jews and Christians concerning what is coming. We need to help them. We need to teach them what they should do. Okay, let's just say, and I've said this before, but I want to drill it into your hearts. Let's say 100,000 Jews and Christians have to flee for their lives during the Great Tribulation. Somebody needs to help them, and we can do it. And if it takes $1,000 per family, and there were 100,000 families needing our help, that'd be $100 million, a huge amount of money. But the government spends that, and more than that, every day. They're spending money to enslave the world. Why don't we spend money to free the world? So I'm asking you right now. It's needed. It's a dire need. If you're out there and you love God, you love Christians, you love the Jewish people, they gave us our Bible, they gave us our Messiah. Now's our chance to help them. I'm asking you today, make the very largest donation that you possibly can. Uh, call us at 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. Or else you can go to endtime.com. Let's do some exploits. Let's do God's will. Let's help God's people around the world. We can do it by God's grace. We're going to do it. is a production of End Time Ministries. This broadcast will be available on our website, endtime.com, in the archive section. On our website, you'll also find more information about how current events are fulfilling Bible prophecy. To reach our operators, call 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. End Time Ministries is partner-supported. We would like to say thank you to our partners who made this broadcast possible. To do what Matthew 24, 14 said, to reach the world with the gospel of the kingdom.